The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome all to the Easy Power Thursday Technical Webinar. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm with the Applications Group at Easy Power, and today, before I introduce our guest speaker, I would appreciate some feedback, as we uh, usually do, and um, invite your comments or, or voting, if you will, on a couple of poll questions. And so we want to start with specifically ARC Flash compliance. And uh, uh, obviously, there's no obligation, but whatever feedback you could provide, let me know where you stand as far as ARC Flash compliance. We like to uh, get some feedback from the audience as we begin the presentation in terms of kind of guiding some of the uh, material and hopefully making it more cogent for the needs of the audience. Here's how folks voted on this one. All right, that's uh, good information. And now our second one has to do with any particular uh, objects that are blocking your way as far as holding you back from participating in a compliance effort. Obviously, this is not comprehensive, but uh, we get some indication as far as where your where your obstacles may come from. There are changes uh, afoot in the uh, the requirements for Arc Flash compliance, and some of those will be covered in future webinars, but I think we're all starting off on a, a new year effort. So here's how people weighed in on that. So um, our guest speaker today is uh, Joel Sandell, a master electrician and a licensed instructor who serves in the electrical code committee and is a practicing engineer for JRS Consulting in the New York City area. Joel provides continuing education and classes for electrical code and theory and is conducting electrical power system studies for major projects such as skyscrapers, hospitals, manufacturing, and other complex projects. And with that, let me turn the presentation over to Joel. Good morning, good afternoon. I believe uh, we are on and everybody can hear me. I am nervous. I have never done this before. So please uh, excuse my nervousness. I will take the courage and try to present some of the things that I've learned. I am very fortunate to have an amazing team of engineers that we work on a lot of power system studies from all kinds of different jobs as small as a small two-story building, as big as a hundred story, you name it. So I'd like to share some of the information and something that I believe will help a lot of people out there with like this subject, like with looking at safety and the reliability and the cost, because this is the problem we face. It's very hard to get a study done that achieves all of them. It is also difficult, in my personal opinion, and it, this may be different by, dif uh, in my, I'm sorry, in my, dif in my personal experience, this may be different with different people, and I don't know who exactly my audience is. I'm sure all over the country you have different, uh, different experiences, but I, I'm assuming it's about the same. And one of the things that we face in many cases is engineer has to face in the design, okay, what am I doing? Am I going with fuses or am I going with circuit breakers? In certain voltages and certain types of industries, it's become common practice to go a particular way. For example, in New York City, because we have a high uh, fault current availability because of the strong network that the utility has up here in the condensed areas such as Manhattan and the surrounding areas as New York City, most of the industry is always looking for fuses because fuses 
are able to interrupt 200 or even 300,000 amps of available fault current. Therefore, it has become kind of an industry standard to go with. Joe, I think we lost your audio. Joe anticipated having technical difficulties, so we'll have to bring him back on the line. So this is just the introduction. This is a little bit who I am uh, and my company, what we do. And a disclaimer, of course, uh, what I'm giving you is just a personal opinion. I'm not representing any official body such as NFPA or IEEE or others. So let's look at a basic design and dive right into it. Uh, as I was explaining, a lot of engineers in the industry are using cookie cutter designs and a lot of places in the industry, they are tending to use either specifically fuses for everything they do or specifically breakers for everything they do. And for example, if I'm looking at this one line, I've got a 2000 amp fuse. And a lot of people are asking, what should I use, a breaker or a fuse? And in my experience, I learned that you have to look at what is the available fault current. If you're looking at a low available fault current, of course, a circuit breaker is going to be cheaper. However, traditionally, fuses have been able to selectively coordinate two to one, which is published information from manufacturers. Circuit breakers is not that easy. So even though the available fault current is low, most people still go with fuses. It's a common industry practice, especially in our neck of the woods. It may be different in other parts of the country. But up here in New York City, most jobs, they're using service disconnect with fused switches. Now the issue is, now that we are becoming slowly more and more conscious about arc flash safety hazards to lower those, the solution to that in some cases is going to be a circuit breaker, in particularly when you have a low fault current. I'm going to jump ahead for a second into this slide, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen it. This is how the fuse manufacturers are going to sell us their product. And I'm not mocking anything, but I'm pointing out that in some cases it's not the answer, because you also need, as much as you need to understand the operation of the fuse, okay, it's going to be able to be current limiting dramatically to reduce the arc flash incident energy at the panel board. At the same time, it's not going to react fast enough if the available fault current is low. And I have seen actual cases of equipment blowing up, causing fires and major damage where the fuses just sat there not clearing any fault. And it took a very long time by the time the fuses cleared the fault. And that was in situations where the fuses were installed in, for example, in Midtown Manhattan, where the available fault current is very high, but the fact is that the fault did not occur at the service disconnect. The fault occurred upstairs on the 13th floor of the building or all the way on the other side of the building, and the available fault current that the fuse saw was relatively low, and it did not work in its current region, in its current limiting region. So when you design a system, you have to look at those things as well. Look at reality. Where will the fault occur? Because I have a maximum available fault current of, let's say, 100,000 amps, doesn't mean that fuse will see that. And I don't think I have to mention this to all the engineers that, you know, I've taken courses from people like Charles Pratt, Jim Phillips, the industry gurus, and they always tell you that the most common fault will be a single line to ground fault, which is, of course, much, much less than the three-phase bolted fault current. And this is the challenge we face when we are analyzing the job. Now, going back to this one line, just as a music is a simple example, if I have a 2000 amp service disconnect and I'm going to feed a 1200 amp device, if I'm looking at selective coordination, which in some jurisdictions, such as New York City, it's required, that's mandatory that I have to have selective coordination, is that going to be selectively coordinated? Probably not. The manufacturer's published data tells you that you need to be a two to one ratio. Now, in the realistically, when there's a fault, it will be lower because it will be aligned to ground fault. It may also be downstream in the panel board or in the middle of the feeder. But we have to consider all of it. Now, changing this design, 
will dramatically affect two things. It'll dramatically affect the price and the cost of the equipment. It'll also affect the arc flash hazard. So when 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 most engineers' drawings come out, and we we get a lot of those where we will do studies, and I will show you such examples. So if you're looking at such an example like this, this is an example of a consultant drawing. It doesn't matter who it is, how old it is, and where the job is, but it's a point of making a reference. I have a utility service coming in. I hope you guys can follow my mouse, my little hand, coming into feeding a switchboard. And I've got some lines going out to feed the fire alarm system, the fire pump. And then I have a 3000 amp circuit breaker feeding a distribution. However, in the end, over here at the end, I've got another 3000 amp circuit breaker feeding a step up transformer, which is going to feed some mechanical equipment. And I had a very hard time explaining to this customer that this is not going to be good because I can't in no way in the world have selective coordination between this 3000 and this 3000, even if I buy fancy trip units such as solid state trip units and I can change and fiddle with the settings. They're both 3000 amp devices. They're both trying to go at the same time. Now, we came up with an idea of changing the design, of course, figuring out restructuring the system and I was able to save this customer a lot of money by redesigning the equipment as well as achieving a reliable system and a safer system. So this is just a simple example. Also, sometimes where people don't think too much are smaller systems. Again, as I said before, I don't know exactly who my audience is. I know some of you guys were probably involved in very large systems, and medium voltage systems, but in our company, in our experience, I get a lot of small jobs as well. And I'll make one example. This is an example of a project, I'm sorry, where you can't see the top because I, I wanted to blow, zoom it in so you can see it on a small screen. On the line side of this bus 15, is a small 15 kVA transformer. Nobody would ever think that this is important, but the fact is this is actually feeding a surgery center, a small operating room. And I know if I would be in there, I would not want the power to go out or anything wrong with this power. And in the same thing, I also had to explain my customer that if it doesn't matter how small this job is, I have to have a good reliable system. So in this case, the reliability is key. And the biggest issue is that a 15 kVA transformer is so small, the available fault current is very low. It will take a very long time for these breakers to react and trip in the event of a fault. And there's no way you can achieve selective coordination between a 50 amp circuit breaker and a 20. Even if this would have been a 100 amp circuit breaker, which is like a five to one, you would still not get selectivity. Therefore, our recommendation was to replace the 50 amp device with a fuse and the customer had to spend extra money in doing that. In some cases, you may have to uh, kind of uh, educate your customer about these things. They don't like it, but that's what we come across in many cases. So this is an example where it's a little tiny job, but it has to have selective coordination, and I replaced it with a fuse upstream. So if there's a fault in the 20 amp branch circuit, that 20 amp breaker will trip, but not tripping or clearing the upstream fuse. Uh, now, going back to this one line, I also have to look at the arc flash. And I also have to look at the load, what is on these systems, because this is also going to change how it's designed and it matters in distance. I know this is not a simple answer. It's a very complicated subject. And some people can spend two days in courses on this alone, but I'm trying to wrap it up in a very short time just to give you a little bit of, 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 what we have been doing, a little bit of tricks of the trade. If I have, for example, 
this 800 amp device that is supposed to be the panel board what you may want to think and of course there's no way i'm going to have selective coordination from between this 800 upstream to this 1200 so i may want to take this 800 out and feed it directly out of this bus but you are redesigning the job and the electrical contract is not going to like that in the field because he's going to end up spending more money the owner is also trying to save money of course so you have to look at those things what is the feeder length going to do also when you have three sets of 600 copper feeding this panel board you have less voltage drop and if i have to run this directly out of this bus of course it's going to depend how long the run is i may have to beef up these conductors because they're a long run so instead of being able to get away with two 500 copper I may have to run more sets or larger wires. So there's a lot of these things that are going to play a role. Now, if I'm changing, going over to the other side where I'm showing, for example, these circuit breakers, I have a 500 being fed from a 2000. I have no problem with selective coordination there. But when I go from a 500 to a 200, most likely you will not be selective coordinated. In the other hand, I may not care about having selective coordination. So you have to either follow the electrical code that governs the uh, area where the job is and, and figure out, do I need selective coordination for that? Depends on what it feeds. Or do I care about selective coordination? Another way how we help a lot of times our customers to save money is serious rating. And I'm sure this is not news to none of you guys. Sidious rating allows me to use a lower AIC rated device. And of course, when I have Sidious rating, I completely lose the selectivity. But if I don't need it, I don't care. What the Sidious rating also does is, of course, it reduces the arc flash hazard. Now, of course, when I have these feeders here, the low voltage feeders, um, these smaller feeders, there's not too much arc flash hazard there that can exist because there's small wires. However, if you're running it very long, it's going to take a long, take a long time for this 500 amp device to trip, and you've brought it back up. And this is an issue that I see in a lot of old facilities that they've not, they haven't thought about this, where the arc flash is never looked at, and you have very long runs, and it takes a very long time for devices to clear a fault. And you end up having with a huge explosion. And you can kill somebody. So this is just going through a couple of different things. Another thing that I want to point out, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to go to a one line. And this has to do, this is important when you're looking at emergency equipment. And for example, uh, I'm sorry, uh, where I'm a little, not this one, it's this one. I apologize. So if I'm looking at this drawing, I have a large screen. I can see it pretty big. I don't know if what sizes you are looking at, but I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit. This is an emergency system. Now, when it, we're talking about an emergency system, there's something very fundamentally different because an emergency generated, regardless how good the generator is, a one megawatt, you're not going to get too much available fault current out of this. And it's considerably, considerably weaker than the utility so, uh, source. So you have to look at the devices in a completely different way. And this is where the challenge comes in. When you're looking at this particular design, this is actually a trick I learned from Charles Pratt, and I love this idea. Contrary to popular belief, average generators do not need main breakers, although every generator vendor is going to try to sell you the breaker because they love to make money, don't we all? But you don't need that breaker in there. That breaker is not protecting the generator. It is only protecting the downstream feeders, and I don't need that. 
The other problem that that breaker causes is selective coordination to the other downstream feeders, which in an emergency system you have to have by code. Now, normally people would put a main circuit breaker and then they would feed a panel board or a switchboard. But what you see here on this one line is a break uh, generated without a main. And we are running a set of wires into a trough and tap out from that trough into a bunch of disconnects. And in the previous code cycles, all the electrical code told us is that the generated wires have to be rated 115%. There was no really rules about tapping. However, in the new code, in the current electrical code, there are rules which refers you back to uh, Article 240.21, and the tap rules are very similar to the original feeder tap rules, which we are used to. And we're doing this here. So we're taking a 10-foot tab rule and tapping into an 800-amp device. And that 800-amp device is going to feed an 800-amp ATS, an, an automatic transfer switch, to feed specific types of loads. And there are a couple of things that I'm achieving here. Number one, I'm saving money removing that big breaker. This is a megawatt. I would have needed a huge breaker that would have costed me anywhere with the customer probably ten to twenty thousand dollars. I'm removing that and I'm eliminating the issue with selective coordination that it would have to feed. Because remember, one of these devices, a couple of devices are actually twelve hundred amps, they're pretty big. And I would have a hard time selectively coordinating them, especially because when there is a fault, they're pretty low and they get difficult to selectively coordinate. Now, the other thing that I'm achieving with this is that I am also complying with 700.10. It used to be in the older code version 700.9, now it's 700.10, I believe. That requires all these loads to be separated. And a lot of design engineers fail to know that. They don't. A lot of people don't, don't realize that, and that's at least how I see that a lot of design engineers don't pay attention too much to code. Let's not let's let's not get into that. But you know, some people don't have too much respect. Some people. I love the code. I have a lot of respect, and I think the code is very important. And we have to follow exactly what the code is. And the code does require separation between the different loads. So, for example, if I'm feeding emergency loads versus legally required or versus optional standby loads. They have to be separated. So if there's a problem with this 800 amp circuit breaker, it will not compromise any of the other circuit breakers. And this is how I design it. So I am actually saving the customer money. And it is a very reliable system. And it is a very safe system. And it co it's code compliant. And the issue tends to be downstream. For example, if I have a 400 amps disconnect right here, feeding a 400 amp switch, uh, I'm sorry, ATS, and then it's feeding an emergency panel board. What some engineers will do is they will have a 200 amp breaker in this panel board. Once you do that, now you're compromising your selective coordination because it's almost impossible to get selective coordination in circuit breakers 200 to 400 amp. Now, is it possible? Yes. If you're going to spend $1,000 for a 200 amp circuit breaker with a very fancy solid state trip unit, yes, you may be able to do it. But I'd rather my customer doesn't have to buy that. And instead of doing that, what I would do is I would take a 400 amp panel board and come out of this panel board. If, I, if, for example, I need another panel board somewhere else in the building, I will use a feed-through lug panel board and continue the 400 amp feeder into another panel board, which is also a 400 amp rated panel board. And this way, I have all my branch circuits in each of these two panel boards 
but I don't have one panel board being a sub panel from another. They are both 400 amp rated panel boards. That also makes it a better system, a more reliable system. The only downside to that is that I have to have a 400 amp feeder. If you want to get around that, you have two options. Either I can size this up to a 600 such as this one, but now you're spending more money for a larger disconnect, circuit, larger circuit breaker, a larger ATS, which I'd rather not do. I can instead divide this 400 in two separate 200 amp feeders, and I can run a 200 amp feeder into a 200 amp panel board, feed through lugs, and then brand, and then continue to another sub panel, which is also a 200 amp panel board. However, I don't have a 200 amp circuit breaker sub feeding a 100. And I don't have sub breakers and I don't have to have very expensive solid state trip units in those circuit breakers. And you're actually getting a very reliable system. But doing a design this way is a little different than, engine, than engineers are used to doing in a cookie cutter design. And I've done this on many jobs and I believe this is a very reliable system. It also works for the customer because it is not very expensive. Now, from an arc flash perspective, of course, it's also very very safe because I'm not talking. We're not we're not sizing very large devices. The arc flash hazard at the generator is going to be as big as the generator can produce. But these generators have protection packages built in. And if something goes wrong, it'll shut itself down. These, of course, are very short. They're kept very short runs. These disconnects are very close to the generator, typically, either right next to it or in the next room or right above it or right below it. So the arc flash hazard is not going to be too great. And once I have these devices, it's not going to be bad at all. The only thing you need to remember is don't go with two big devices. These are 1200s, but this is a large facility. This actually happens to be a nursing home. And because it's a large facility, they needed a one megawatt unit, and it has a lot of devices. And these 1200s are feeding a lot of mechanical equipment, such as air conditioning and heating. And they have panel boards here where we have a lot of branch circuits and whatnot. Now, I believe this is a excellent way of designing a system, and it also answers a lot of the problems. On the utility side, this one, this particular design called for, uh, I'm sorry, this is not the utility side. The utility side uh, looked like this. In the utility side, we did kind of a similar situation where we have a 2000 amp service disconnect from the utility and it feeds a large copper detail box where we're also tapping out into individual disconnects. Now in the utility side, you can put all of these devices into one panel board because the code does not require separation happens to be in this particular design, it worked. It was more economical to do it separate enclosures because of some existing field conditions. And again, every single job will be different that requires different solutions. This is just the way we did it on here and it works great. The largest device is a 1200. Feeding that from a 2000 gets very tricky. If you look in the table of manufacturer, you're gonna, you, you may not see that it selectively coordinates. However, if you look carefully, these are circuit breakers and these are fuse, this is a fuse and we're able to use the setting because this is a solid state trip unit and we're able to make sure that the setting will allow that the circuit breaker should trip before the fuse in 99% conditions. And as, I, as a lot of experts in this industry say, you can almost never have perfect selective coordination. 
but we still do our best. And this is a way to do it. There's many ways other than this. I'm not saying this is the only way or the perfect way, but this is just some experience that I'm sharing with some of you that uh, may help you in your ideas with designing equipment. Now, uh, I also, of course, I mean, this is, I'm sure that my audience is uh, engineers in the industry that you've seen all of these things in the past. Now, a lot of the jobs that we see have all sorts of different types of breakers such as this. And what has bothered me for many years is that most people are always going to say, what is the solution to these problems? This. Oh, spend a couple of thousand dollars on this 250M breaker. This is actually a two and a half thousand dollar breaker with a fancy solid state trip unit. This WL breaker, which all the manufacturers make a similar version of this, and very good technology, amazing products. I actually love it, but it's also very expensive. And it's not always the solution. I don't like when most of the time I see studies from other people that their solution, their recommendation will be, okay, add a solid state trip unit and it's gonna solve your problem. And I have to admit I have done that too in some jobs, but it's not always the answer. It's not always going to solve the problem. Yes, I can take a solid state trip unit and have all these different areas of the TCC changing where and how it's going to react. But if it depends what you have upstream and depends what you have downstream, that is going to not, going to limit you with whether this is going to work. And the most compromising thing is two things you have to remember is that even if I have all these features, if I don't have the right uh, fault, because every time a fault occurs, it's different. One of my favorite quotes is from uh, Eric Stromberg. He says, you have to analyze how a system fails. And that's what you have to look here. How, it, how will it actually fail? And every time there's a fault in a system, it's different. So I have to look at where will the fault be in the system? Will it be at the end of the line? in the middle or at the beginning, and what type of fault will it be? You have to really play around with figuring out what type of fault, because every single type of fault will, of course, have a different result. And this is not always the answer to say, okay, I'm gonna have a solid trip unit, and this is gonna be the end of it, and it's a beautiful world. It's not always the answer. Sometimes you have to dig back into your design I'm sorry, and figured out, okay, why don't we redesign it? Such an example, I'll tell you, I don't actually have a one line of it. I, I apologize, I didn't really spend too much time presenting this, uh, although I wish I would. I kept scratching my head what I should bring up. I'll give you an example. The common design in the industry I typically see, let's say I have a 1,000 kVA transformer feeding a substation you will see on the load side of the substation a main breaker. And then you will see feeder breakers or branch breakers. But instead of putting that large 1200 or, 50 or a 2000 amp circuit breaker as the main coming off of the load side of the transformer, you may think, okay, why don't I come out with three smaller circuit breakers instead? The three smaller breakers may give me a better solution because I am dividing the load in a different way. So sometimes this solid state trip unit is amazing technology, I'm not mocking it, but it's not always the answer. Now, it is amazing, especially now with some of them having the maintenance duty that I can have a very nice setting of selectivity, but yet an electrician can walk into the job, press that button, and have that trip unit change to the lowest and sensitive setting so the arc flash goes down, and it appears that I've achieved both worlds, but that's not necessarily true. 
this is going to require the electrician to remember before he goes home to turn off the maintenance duty. And if he doesn't, then it's not a good day. And there's other issues with it I'm not going to bother going into. But, again, there's different options where South City is not always the answer. Also, you have to consider another thing. Circuit breakers are available today as high as 200K AIC. And I'm surprised that not a lot of people know about these. So you can buy a circuit breaker. This is just a standard 60 amp circuit breaker and it can go up to 200,000 AIC. Yes, smoke will come out of it when it trips, but it will trip. And in some cases, this is the solution rather than putting fuses. Now, I don't have a magic wand, and I don't have a perfect world to, uh, a perfect solution to everything, but these are just some of the overview ideas that I've learned over the years. And I believe there's a little bit there that I could help everyone. Now, uh, I may have not have covered everything that I wanted, but uh, I think I will, I think this is about roughly what I wanted to bring out. Are there any questions? Joe, <laughs> there's a question here. Yeah. Okay. It says, without the circuit breaker at the generator, how are the feeder conductors protected? Okay. Uh, great question. Um, well, the answer is very simple. Every generator you buy these days has a protection package. In fact, if you look inside the generator, you will see that it has a controller. The controller is monitoring a bunch of conditions and it's monitoring all those conditions such as low temperature, high temperature, low voltage uh, surges, a lot of different things. If something goes seriously wrong with the generator, the controller package will shut it down. That does not necessarily con uh, protect these conductors. However, these conductors are protected in a sense that they have to be sized no less than 10% at 10 foot tap. And that is why in the 14 NEC and the newer versions, they added this requirement. So you have a very short wire that will be deemed protected because it is very short, only 10 foot, 10% 10 of the size of the generator. Now, they are not being protected from short circuit by the downstream device. The downstream device will protect it, in essence, backwards on an overload condition. So if there would be an 800 amp device, for example, this will limit the load to 800 amps. Therefore, it provides overload protection for the upstream conductor as well. But in a short circuit condition, because it is only 10 feet, it is enough to shut down the generated controller package. And that's how these conductors are protected. But you would have to follow the tap rules. And uh, I hope I answered the question. It's, a, it's, it's almost the same exact thing as you have a feeder. For example, you have a 800 amp feeder, 240.21 allows you to tap. You have the 10 foot tap rule option or the 25 foot tap rule option, which is one third of the upstream device. And this is following the same concept. As Jules, here's another one that's kind of a follow up to this. It says, if the AHJs and utilities require a visible disconnect between the generator and the load served by the utility, is a generator output breaker required in that case? Yeah, in some places that is true but it doesn't have to have an overcurrent protective device. It can be a simple disconnect. So you can put an unfused switch or you can use a basically a circuit breaker that does not have a trip unit and it's simply a molded case switch. And it is available, they do make it, but vendors try to charge a little extra for that. 
but you can do that. Now, I'm not saying that not putting, a, uh, that I'm not saying that this is a perfect design and this is the only design. Please don't get me wrong. Uh, in many jobs, we do put a main breaker on the generator, but it's going to depend on the loads and what facility it is in. This happens to be a nursing home where we have different types of emergency loads. NFPA 99 requires what's called an EES type, an essential electrical system, and there are different requirements how you must have separation of devices and feeders and ATSs and a lot of other things to consider. So from a reliability perspective and saving some money and getting the job done right, this is a very good way of doing it. And yes, you can put a simple disconnect uh, that without fuses, and it will still comply with that requirement that you must have a disconnect at the generator. There is a downside to that, because in some jurisdictions such as New York City, there is a requirement that a fire pump and fire alarm feeders must be mains. And if you see over here, this fuse switch is feeding the fire alarm, the fire pump, and this is feeding the fire alarm system. Now, these cannot be on the load side of any other breaker. They must be directly connected to the alternator of the generator. So if I would have to put a main here, I would also have to add two additional small mains at the generator, and these two devices would have to be at the generator. But for the rest of the devices, I can feed it from a non-fused switch. Okay, there's a couple others that are kind of related. Uh, one is, how do we know if the generator bus is adequate for short circuit, especially if there are large motors in the system that will feed current into the system at a fault? Okay, that's very simple because this bus, you kind of make this up either by using kind of Pilatus connectors or you're using a copper detail bus bar such as in this particular case. And what you use is the basic industry standard bus density of 1,000 amps per square inch. And you are sizing this feeder and this bus 150% percent of the full out output of the generator and that is actually in the code in 440 I don't remember the exact subsection maybe that 14 something like that that the output conductors of the generator which the code calls the generator conductors have to be sized 115 percent to the full load output of the generator and that's how they have enough protection and they're adequately sized Here's another question that's asking about Easy Power. It says, does Easy Power have the ability to model a tap rule? The answer is yes. Uh, Joel, do you have to utilize that? Yeah. Oh, of course. In many cases, uh, uh, Easy Power is amazing. I mean, I, I always tell this to people. Uh, before I bought Easy Power, and uh, uh, now I now we have three licenses. I did a lot of research. Uh, and I I do not regret that. Absolutely, they can make this. They can model this exactly as you show as as we show it here. No question about that. And then one last one as far as the follow up on the generator. Do we need a main breaker when we have more than six switches? No, absolutely not. The six disconnect rules of Article 230. That, if I remember correctly, 71 does not apply to a generator. Please remember that in Article 230, the definition of service is only utility service. Any other use source, such as a generator, a solar system, a wind, or anything else is not service. People confuse it many times because in many cases, the code refers back to certain sections of Article 230. For example, on the load side of a separately derived system, certain rules that apply to a service apply to that as well. But a lot of people by mistake uh, consider an emergency generator source such as utility. No, it's not. The six rule does not apply to a generator power at all. You can put 20 breakers if you want. And I, in fact, checked the UL standard for generators, and they do not have a limit how many circuit breakers or disconnects you can connect directly to a generator. 
So I think that's the last of the questions that I see. If any questions we didn't get to, uh, we'll be happy to follow up via email. Uh, and Joel will have those after the session. Uh, Joel, I appreciate your contribution very much and your uh, support of Easy Power. So I think we're going to. You're close, very welcome. I think we're going to close out the uh, session for today, and we look forward to working with you down the road. Have a good day. All right. Take care. And uh, I hope it was a little bit of help to everyone.